Hi, everybody. We are back with Nicole Barish from ISTA Solutions. And I was just talking to, to Nicole before we actually started off this particular podcast. And Nicole gave me a really good perspective of where ISTA Solutions started. So, Nicole, why don't you tell me a little bit about the earlier days of ISTA and really how you ended up um, being one of the critical employees to join the company at the very beginning. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, Liam. Um, so we actually have a bunch of different sister companies. Um, I started working uh, 14 years ago. We have a, a home care agency. So I started started there um, as a young, <laughs> a very young person um, and was there for quite a few years. And ISTA Solutions we um, is, is an outsourcing and call center, right? So our, mm -hmm. our workforce is located in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And the company was actually founded by accident. It wasn't intended. Um, one of our other sister companies focuses on on bringing in PTs and OTs from the Philippines. So they have a review center, they help them pass the tests, they sponsor them to come here, get visas and come here. And out of that business, because we had uh, a presence there, they started to hire some people there for themselves, right? We have a bunch of different companies, let's hire some people to process some payroll and do some back office stuff. And before we knew it, we had outside companies um, that found out we sort of had this access and were asking for employees for themselves. Um, so it, it sort of grew out of a true need, just a, a true need that mm. we didn't even know existed. Um, so I wasn't there from day one. Uh, Debbie Weinfeld, our CEO, sort of took, took on this. It was just a, a baby project. Mm -hmm. And then as it grew... Um, wanted more of a, you know, a, an extra set of hands here on the U.S. side of things. And so they, they plucked me out of home care. And um, so I've, I've been with ISTA ever since. I want to say maybe that was about five, five, six years ago. Um, so when I started, they had, I don't know, maybe, maybe 50 agents, 50 employees working out there for a couple of different companies. Um, and now we have well over a thousand. So it's wow. been it's been a fun journey. Let's um, let's jump back a second to just talk about the journey from 50 to a thousand. Did you yeah. guys identify particular bumps along that road? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are listening right now that run BPOs and are thinking to themselves, okay, how did you, and how many years to get to 1,000 people from 50 to 1,000? Five years, right? Five, six years? Um, yeah, I think the company itself has been about seven years, um, but okay. the, the major growth has happened, I'd say, in the last two to three. We really uh, exponentially grew. So was that an effect of COVID or was that something else? So a couple, I think it was a, a um, it was a perfect storm of events. Uh, COVID was definitely helpful to us. Um, it was something that that we uh, benefited our, our our industry, our business. Um, you know, businesses continue to to thrive. You know, especially the businesses that we were um, we were servicing. Um, and now a lot of the, a lot, one of our biggest obstacles for companies was, you know, we're talking about remote work, right? How do I, how do I possibly have what I'm doing here and not be able to see them and not have them be in my office. And then from one day to the next, their whole office was now remote, right? There was, right. was not, was not next to them. So people became much less precious about, I have to have my staff with me. So that really helped sort of eliminate that obstacle, um, with a lot of the companies we were dealing with. Um, we had onboarded a new sales guy who was very, very good and, um, you know, really brought in, brought in a lot of business. Business. Um, and I think just it was it was uh, we started to gain real traction with sort of um, people knowing who we who we were right so referrals of clients um, you know within the types of companies we were servicing um, it became a name right it's like mm -hmm. oh you're looking to you know you're looking to outsource I you know we work with ISTA give them a call um, so it really was a bunch of different things that, that occurred to, to lead to that to that major growth um, but in terms of challenges yeah I mean like any company you know it's it's funny, we work with all different kinds of companies, right? And so we get an inside view on their operations, on their process. Right. And, you know, big companies, companies, you know, big professional companies, and you go in there and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they do it this way. I can't believe they have their whole office working off of spreadsheets. This is crazy. And we, we left that all the time because it's like no company starts big, right? Everybody right. starts small. You start with one person, you start with a few people, and what works for a few people before you know it is no longer sustainable when you have a thousand people working for you, right? You just, mm -hmm. There's just no way. Um, but it's growing pains, right? And you have to get there and you have to sort of learn what, what's working, what's not. Um, so we really were on a, you know, every year of, of structure and management. We brought in gosh, I want to say maybe at least three or four years ago. It was right, it was before COVID. Um, Neo Samson, who's our VP of operations out there, he runs the whole show. He is, um, he's an amazing guy, right? He came to us a lot of years experience type of guy that 
came up from, he was uh, agent from agent level, came all the way up to where he is. So from the ground up, really learned every, every aspect of this business. Um, and he really took us from, you know, from, from point A to point B and, and um, legitimized a lot of our processes and stuff. So it's, hmm. um, it continues to be an evolution. We continue, are always looking, this is a, something, a real strength of our CEO. She's always looking, how can we do better, right? It's never about, okay, things are going well, let's stay, let's sit pat and like what we're doing. It's always about, we can make this better. We can improve our, our internal systems and, and our internal um, processes. And so we're, we, we believe in change here. So we're constantly trying, trying to evolve anyway. Would you say that that's one of your, your differentiators in the market is like just your efficiency of processes? Because from what I've spoken to you guys about at ISTA, <clears throat> you have a really multifaceted set of clients, right? Yeah. If, if, I, if I said, oh, are you a, um, you know, we have BPO clients that specialize in the dentistry back office industry as an example right. and they have a couple of thousand right. seats on that or we have people that are um just designers or we have people that are just video editors or we have people that just do call center work right but you do a whole bunch of those different things combined and initially i th i actually thought wow that's maybe a big problem for you guys because where do you specialize and where does the market really understand who you are but as you discuss it that it might actually be a huge market differentiator for you, which is like, you're a complete business in a box for a lot of businesses that are thinking, oh yeah, okay, well, um, IST is not just going to take care of my call center needs. They're going to take care of my design needs or my accounting needs or my bookkeeping needs or my, um, whatever it might be. You've got a lot right. of different type of right. client verticals that you're in. Explain that and how you've been able to actually achieve that because I have not seen that in the BPO industry as of late. You're quite rare. Yeah, it is. It is the harder way to do it. <laughs> it is much easier if you're just going to focus on, you know, those big companies you talk about teleperformance and, you mm -hmm. know, concentrics and those kinds of, you know, they're, they're focused on customer service, right? So they're experts right. at customer service. And yes, each industry is a little bit different, but they're just sort of manufacturing customer service. You know, with us, we, we service a lot of different, mo you know, mostly within healthcare. We are sort of focused on the healthcare space. We have a few outliers, but mostly within healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then, yeah, a lot of different companies with, 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 in that within under under that umbrella right um and every company even within the same you know you can work with medical billing companies you can work with um you know dme companies but then each one of those companies does things differently right they use different softwares they have different processes whether they're good or not you know is it's their business right so they everybody's doing things a little bit differently um so it is it is a challenge um and that's why we are you know the only way to kind of bridge that gap is to be very management heavy mm -hmm. um so it's you know we have a lot of management on the Philippine side of things from operations to we created a whole department we call it OPEX it's called operational excellence mm -hmm. and these are people that we brought in that have training backgrounds so maybe they don't necessarily know medical billing but they know good training they know good process they know how to take what somebody's what what somebody is giving over and how to localize that there and how to build materials and build a foundation um, so that our teams can have references so that we if we need to add agents you know that they're the training is being done in a standardized way so we really had to create a whole department Department to help facilitate that. Um, also, especially because a lot of our clients are coming to us and they're not necessarily so mature in this area, right? They mm -hmm. haven't outsourced before or, you know, uh, the training and like process is not anybody's core business, right? When you talk about somebody's core business, mm -hmm. you know, you're selling DME equipment. Training is not on your mind. My mm -hmm. Equipment is is what I is 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 what I'm focused on. Um, right. And now when you're outsourcing the the training and the quality assurance and KPIs, you know, all these things that nobody has ever even thought about because it's just, I, I have somebody that's next to me when she has a question, she asks me the question and I can see with my eyes that she's working and we all go about our business. Um, but in outsourcing, obviously that's not, it's different, right? You don't have that, you know, they're not next to you. So you do mm -hmm. have to, to um, you know, really be very strategic about those things. And a lot of our clients come to us having not really experienced that, right? So it's new for them. And so we have to sort of hold their hand and, and help them through it. Um, you know, they're giving over training and we have to say, okay, there's, there's gaps in this process, right? So how do you want can, this to look? Can you tell me more about that? So a client shows up to you and says, look at our fantastic training. Look at all the process yeah. documentation <laughs> that we have. Um, Nicole, here it is and yeah. really excited to give it to you. And, and you're not going to need to do any work past yeah. this, right? It's just set and forget. 
Um, what do you see? Because you've probably seen a lot of them. What do you see as the biggest gaps that a lot of, or the biggest mistakes that people make where they're handing that documentation over to you guys, or at least their version of the documentation? Where do you initially need to take it um, in your experience? Um, I think that it generally is the, the, it lacks specificity usually, right? So okay. you take for granted that if I have a task where it's, um, I, let's say I have to follow up with somebody, right? I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to get payment, right? So you reach out to somebody and try to get payment. Now either they answer your call or they don't, right? Now the client knows that the objective is to get the payment. They're not always necessarily mapping it out for the agent the best way to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll say, okay, you just need to follow up with them until you finally get through to them. Well, it's how am I following up, right? Am I emailing? Mm -hmm. Am I calling? At what frequency? Do you want me to call every five minutes? Do you want me to call mm -hmm. tomorrow? Do you want me to call next week? Um, so a lot of times it's, it's really not defining a lot of those, those smaller steps um, in the task. Um, and so what winds up happening is that the agents do what they think is best, right? I, I, right. Genu I genuinely believe people show up to work to do a good job, right? For the mm -hmm. most part. Um, people are not showing up to not do a good job. So they're doing what they think fits into what it should be done. It's not necessarily what the client had in mind. Um, and so then there's a disconnect, right? And then eventually the client turns around and is like, well, how come we're only reaching out to them once a week? Well, I don't know, because we didn't say, you didn't say to do anything different, right? You said to follow up, so this is how we're following up. Um, so at this point, right, we can sort of look at a process, we can look at those materials and say, you know what, there's a gap here, right? You're mm. saying that you want them to follow up on this, on this collection, on this payment. How do you want them to? What, you know, in, in what method? If they're sending an email, is there a template? Is there a partic particular language you want them to use, right? right? So it's really defining every one of those steps um, because the more you define it, just, of course, the more standardized the work is going to be. Yeah, no, it's a, so we have a feature. I know that you guys aren't opted into as one of our beta features at Time Doctor called Process Paths. Mm -hmm. And so what it allows you to do is to be able to look at the start of a ticket and the end of a ticket. And then we know what the end state is for that ticket. Was that a high MPS ticket? What was the CSAT score on it? Um, right. What was our average handle time? And right. once you start to process tens of millions of tickets, you start to actually really identify some interesting flows. Like if you want high MPS, you have to spend 10% of your time on video calls with clients. And you spend 2% of your time on video calls with clients, right? Sure. So it's like one of those things where everyone thinks that they have the best processes on the face of the planet. Yeah. And the vast majority of the time, when I ask clients, who actually produced these processes? I was, oh, I did. When's the last time you, uh, you sat down and you did a month of answering tickets on support? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, four or five years ago, or I never did it. And I was like, so right. why are you the best person <laughs> to do this? <laughs> like, you, right. are, you don't understand this at all, right? And so yeah. I, it, generally, it is always going back to the actual people on the front line of the organization and really analyzing what are you doing? Why are you a best performer in your particular right. job? And how can we share that knowledge with as many people as possible? Sounds like you guys are essentially doing the same thing um, that we do. Yeah. Yeah, we really try to, I think, um, sound you guys are a little more technically, uh, you know, your, your whole thing is, is the tech and, and the software. Right. So we're doing it a little, little bit differently, probably a little more of a manual way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's all about data. You know, it's amazing. Um, again, clients are just not tracking it that way. And, you know, for us, it's really about, I want, how do, in order for me to help you, I have to know what the problem is, right? So you you come to me, a client comes to me with the result of you're not collecting enough money, right? Your, your mm -hmm. agents are not being successful in collecting money, but they don't know why, right? So it's up mm. to me to try to figure out the why. And the only way I can figure out the why is if I have the information, right? I have the data, which is, okay, you know, we see that it's much more successful, right? They're much more successful when they email, when they text versus when they call. Right. Um, so we really, we're very big on that and try to accumulate as much data as we can, um, you know, with, with the client's help to be able to solve, to be able to solve the problems. Cause you can't, you can't, you can't solve the problem if you don't know, if I don't know why it's a problem. Um, so that's, that's really a lot of, a lot of what we're doing, um, you know, in, in, in helping clients be successful. Got it. And, and you mentioned that you're located in the Philippines. Are there any other countries that you are located in? Um, so our workforce is right now just in the Philippines. Um, okay. as, as a corporation, we have, uh, we have some staff in Toronto and Israel, so as, as well as here in New Jersey and the US. Um, so we're a little spread out. Um, we believe in work distribution here. Um, but uh, 
but yeah, our, our workforce right now is in the Philippines. We've, we've looked towards other countries. Um, you know, obviously that's a big project sort of to expand out sure. other countries. Um, you know, Spanish speaking countries is, is one that we've looked seriously at. Um, but right now we're just really focused on the Philippines. So then looking at that, any big challenges in growing in the Philippines? Have you been there as of yet? Or I, you still I have, have yes, okay. I have. I've been there, I don't know, almost eight or nine times, I think. Um, oh. we didn't go usually, usually, uh, I try to go about, about once a year, sometimes more frequently if there's stuff going on. Um, uh, okay. but there's nothing, it's, uh, it's, it's a shame it's so far. It's a very mm -hmm. big trip <laughs> to head right. out there, but there's just nothing quite like going there and seeing, seeing things in action, you know, getting that, that personal feel and meeting with people and just, um, you know, the one, the one thing I think that's challenging about outsourcing, um, or having, you know, your staff being not with you is how do you maintain a through line of culture? Right. How do we make mm -hmm. sure like what our how we want our business to look and run and feel is happening, happening over there. And like I said, we happen to have a, a really great guy, Neo, and he he has come here a bunch and we've gone there. And I think that he really imbibes who we are and who, you know, David Greisman, the owner, and he was, who's a very special person and like what what that ethos is and to be able to to. Um, you know, implement that over there, um, not just from like a company, a company and who we are to our clients, which is important, but like who we are to our employees as well, right? That, mm -hmm. that type of culture that, you know, open door policy and we want, we want employee engagement. We want our employees to, um, we want them to enjoy coming to work, right? So, um, you know, so going there and, and being able to give over like who we are and what, what is important to us, um, it's just, there's no, there's no shortcut for that. Um, right. so we've definitely, uh, we, we definitely try to go as frequently as we can. Um, and then in terms of, in terms of challenges, I think it's just, it's competition, you know, it's just, is there's a lot of competition for talent. Um, and so we, you know, we scoop up talent, even if we don't need it right now, it's, I find good talent, I'll find a place for you. Right. So it's mm -hmm. just about sort of scooping up as much good talent as you can. Um, but yeah, there's just, there's a lot of, a lot of competition these days, um, in, in, in keep in finding and, and retaining good talent. Yeah. I, I know, um. Anytime I'm in Manila, you don't see all of the billboard advertising is for teleperformance yeah. <laughs> or for, or for these, yes. come work at this BPO, come work at that BPO. And it's just such yes. a huge culture shift from having, you know, McDonald's, uh, on the yep. side of a building. So yep, the, the culture and is it, that the talent is definitely one of those issues that I'm, I'm right there with you on. Yeah. And because we're so, we're so sort of boutique and we're specialized in our clients, you know, they know their staffing and it's not a teleperformance where you're servicing a uh, Verizon and they have a thousand, you know, a, a thousand headcount and they don't care, Mary, John, Joe, who leaves, who goes, they just, you know, right. they're looking at the numbers. Our clients care, right? They genuinely care about who's on their team. They, we invest in the training, our clients invest in the training. Um, so when Mary leaves, it's a hit, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it, 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 it hurts. Um, so, you know, we, it's, it's a challenge and it's something that we really pour a lot of resources and time and money into, um, you know, to create, uh, you know, retention. That's awesome. Uh, just kind of speaking to that as well. Let's say that you have a client, oh, sorry, let's say you have an employee that's looking at Convergis, Teleperformance or ISTA Solutions. Time how do helps you... us with that. Yes. Okay. How, how do you, how do you end up attracting the, the talent, because I feel, you know, like, how do you differentiate yourself from, from the rest of the market? Because there's such a huge explosion. And we've seen this basically post 2020 <laughs> is yeah. we've just seen this market expand yet again. Yeah. So for the people that are those, you know, um, we like to call them, we have a lot of clients that call them platinums, me meaning essentially a top 10 percentile performer inside mm -hmm. of that organization. How do you attract those people? Because they can go anywhere at this point. They can go anywhere and they can probably make more money elsewhere, if we're being honest, right? There's mm -hmm. a cap, you know, these companies have uh, have much more uh, versatility when it, when it comes to these things. Um, right. what, we, what we are offering is um, the ability to create. Um, you know, a lot of these big companies, you go in and it's, you just fit into what role they have and you have to do it their way and that's it, right? That's going to be, you, mm. that's your life now. Um, at ISTA, you know, we really give a lot of autonomy and control to the, to our leadership, um, all the way down to, you know, the team lead level. 
um, where they are in they are client facing. They are talking to our clients. You know, that's not something that in team leads and a lot of other organizations are doing, right? So they are they are being sort of dropped in and being given a lot of experience and a lot of control to to create, to be proactive, to come to us and say, I have an idea and this is this is what this is what my idea is, and to be heard. Um, and I think that's just not so common in this setup, right? The setup is sort of in most of these big companies, it's sort of uh, it's a you know it's it's a conveyor belt, right? It's a line and you sort of move up the line, but you have to fit within the structure that they give you. And um, you know, with us, you really you have if if you're the type of person that wants to that wants to grow and wants to create and wants to do those things, um, we have those opportunities. And I think we have some very unique and very special talent that was driven uh, that was uh, sort of um, driven to us because of that, right? And and um, that really appealed to them. And I think that it does it does appeal to a special kind of person to uh, to, to to succeed in that. So we have we have some really great talent. Um, like I said, that we we we've grown we've grown a lot, and so they've really created a lot of these things from scratch, right? They've created mm -hmm. something from nothing. Um, and, and so I think I think that's what we're offering. That's a little bit a little bit different than the other companies. Mm. Yeah, no, I can commend you on that one. I uh, I peeked at your glass door reviews before we jumped on for this call. And it looks like you actually are performing above the average BPO. So that's incredibly exciting that you're giving those people the autonomy and creativity to really kind of do what they want to do. And that's definitely an attractant, I would assume, if I'm the um, if I'm a hopper that's just been jumping from BPO to BPO every six months, figuring out how can I make more money at the end of the day, do I right. really want to actually do something exciting? Um, right. that, that lights me up internally, right? Yeah, and, and that's really what we're, we're that, those, those are honestly the people that we want, right? Those are the people that I want in my leadership roles and, you know, heading my departments are the people that want to, um, like, you know, we here like to evolve and we want people there that, that are looking to evolve as well. Let's, um, let's jump gears a, a little bit here. Talking about just, you talked about how you have a thousand people inside of your organization, What's the average seat count for a particular client? Are you talking about very small stuff like two to three seats or are you talking about hundreds of seats? Like what's what's the makeup or it might be everything and anything in between. Um, we definitely we definitely run the um, run the spectrum there. Um, we have, you know, I'd say our, our you know, 10 percent of clients are, are you know, uh, uh, probably allowing for, for a high, you know, the, the higher number of C counts. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when, again, when you start off small, yeah, we were taking sort of the one seat, the two seats, um, you know, you just sort of take whatever you can get, you know, mm -hmm. we, we have, we have graduated from that, right? That's not necessarily what we're looking to do. Um, not just from our perspective, but from a client's perspective, we just find, you know, if you're going to start with a person or two, you're not really setting yourself up for success, right? First of all, how much, how much is it really helping you, right? A big part of this is cost savings. So a company right. that only needs a person or two, you know, how much are you saving versus what your investment is to make this successful, right? A, right. a company that's outsourcing a hundred positions is saving a lot of money, right? So it's worth right. it to them to really invest in this process. Um, and, you know, just from, you know, from a foundational standpoint, if you only have one person, you know, if that person doesn't work out, now you're left with zero people, right? So it's just, it's not the, it's not the path we, we, we want to head down for, for a client's sake. And then you have, you know, clients that are not happy, right? They have a bad taste in their mouth. Oh, outsourcing is no good and it just doesn't work. Well, you know, we didn't really, you didn't really set this up to, to work properly. Um, so, you know, we, we still have some of those. We still have some of those lingering, you know, one or two seaters. Um, mm -hmm. I would say on average are the, 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 the size of the, the companies we're dealing with. On average, we have companies are starting between, you know, three to five seats. Um, I mean, maybe say like four to, you know, four to six seats in that range. Um, but I think something we're really proud of is that we really, we see a lot of organic growth. Um, you know, so companies start with, you know, let's say a five or six seats. Um, and within that first year or two, you know, they're well into 20, 30 seats. Um, right. So that, that organic growth is, um, is really sort of our bread and butter. And it's, and it's our, um, it's our measure of success, right? If you're mm. growing with us, then that means it's working, right? You're doing right. a good job. You're getting a good service. It's operation. So it's never all hundred percent, you know, roses, right? There's always ups and downs, but, um, you know, our customer service and, and the amount that we give to our clients, I think, um, you know, lends itself well to, to growth. Yeah. That, that actually is, I mean, you're a broken record in that context, the one to two seaters, everyone that I've spoken to has consistently stated it just doesn't work. Yeah. It's and just it's, really hard. It's very frustrating. And it's one of those traps that I think a brand new BPO getting into this industry would think, 
yeah, okay, well, let's, you know, John just wants to hire one person, but let's yeah. do it, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. like the cost of entry is actually going to cost you way more than any of the money that you're going to make on that single seat. Yep. And and it's something that I've continuously told BPO leaders, stay away from those one-seaters. Like just say three seats to start. Yeah. Three seats to start. And if you're not three seats, you're not part of our business, right? You're not right. a qualified lead. But um, (laughs) I say that, but yet almost everyone in the industry that's under 500 seats, that's what they're filled up with. Yeah. And and it's just so hard. It's It's so hard, hard. isn't it? You know, I rather and if you're not in the industry, maybe it maybe it doesn't um, you don't think about it as much. But I rather, you know, if I have to if I have to grow by 500 seats, give me five clients of 100 seats each. Right. Rather than. 10 seats here and five seats here and three seats here. It's just, it, at some point it becomes somewhat unmanageable, right? Because mm-hmm. I can't, I can't possibly give the same level of service if I have 200 different clients, right? I mean, it's right. just, it's not, it's not possible. Um, and, and all your, all your ratios, you know, get, get squeezed, you know, my, an account manager can oversee X amount of seats, but there's only X amount of clients they could really be on top of, right? Even right. if, even if you're not meeting your, your seat quota. Um, so it just, it affects everything down the line. Um, but yeah, when you start, it's really hard. It's hard to say no. It's hard to say no to the, to that client because you're like, well, what if, you know, what if it it grows and sometimes it does, but in my experience, a lot of times it does not, right? If a client (laughs) is only needing one or two seats, that's about all you're really going to be at, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. I would say based off of my experience and I've never run a BPO, but I do talk to a lot of them. The chance that a single seater expands is about 10%. Yeah, and yeah. so if right you me, think yeah. about, I'm going to hire a hundred or I'm going to, I'm going to basically work with a hundred single seaters. Only 10 of those people actually be, actually end up becoming profitable for you. Now, maybe yeah. you have a really good referral business and you can actually get those small guys to refer bigger guys over to your business model. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's really a difficult number to be able to work out. And that's why I tell a lot of people, those single seaters, not worth it for you. Yeah, you know, and yeah. I guess we all we all get there in due time, right? Y'all, we all figure that out eventually. Um, but yeah, so well, hopefully, we if people real- are listening to this right now and they're thinking about starting a BPO, I've told them, and you've told them, do yes. not do it. Don't do it <laughs> under it's any tempting. circumstances the whatsoever. The carrot is very tempting, but it is right. a trap. Don't exactly. do it. Exactly. Um, and really, it's not worth it for those clients either. You know, we, you know, we're at a certain price point, and part of that is because of all the shared resources we have. But if mm-hmm. you only have one or two seats, I'm not even really giving you those resources because it's not, it's not worth it for me, right? Because I, I, there's right. more, there's more important things that are happening, bigger clients, you know, bigger, bigger issues that are going on. So I'm not giving it to you anyway. Um, as opposed to if you just go to one of these services, you go to an Upwork or you, you know, you, you, you do something like that. It's really more beneficial for the client as well. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, absolutely. I want to also kind of, we talked about average seat size, what kind of clients you serve, all that kind of stuff. What are the critical numbers that ISTA Solution really pays attention to? Like if you had to choose three numbers that are really critical to your business that you're monitoring, maybe even on a daily basis, but definitely a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis, what are those numbers to ISTA? Um, Attrition. Is definitely okay. one of them. Uh, that's something that's really important to us. That um, you know we, we monitor pretty closely. Um, like mm-hmm. I mentioned before, you know our, our clients work so closely with their teams that you know losing one, even one person could could have a whole ripple effect. So attrition is important to us. Um, I would say it's not necessarily data. We have a, we have a, we we have a weekly business review. Um, so for our clients, we're looking at, um, quality assurance data, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we're looking at by, by clients, you know, what, what are they doing volume wise? Um, you know, so are they, are they hitting their volume metrics? And then mm-hmm. of course the, the quality scores, right? So is the work that they're doing being done correctly, um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. for, for us to be able to monitor the actual production. Um, and then I would say it sort of plays into this a little bit, um, which is attendance. Um, that's something that we monitor pretty closely as well. Um, okay. During COVID, obviously, we had the best attendance we've ever had. People working from home, right? All of right. a sudden, uh, the little, you know, the stomach aches are no longer keeping you from working, right? You're just right. able to, to work from home. All those all those excuses fall away. Um, mm-hmm. So as we have sort of pivoted to moving most of our most of our uh, workforce back to the office, um, attendance is something that we, we, we pay special attention to. Um, 
you know, because again, that just it really not only does it affect our bottom line, right? Every every hour not worked is, is an hour not billed. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but again, from a client perspective, attendance and, and sort of reliability is is very important to them. Got it. Okay. And so, yeah, it's it's such an interesting interesting um, number that you talked about the very first one, which was attrition. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys do to mitigate that? Like what's your, if you had to think about, or maybe a better question to ask is what are the biggest learnings that you've had over the last few years outside of culture, which we already discussed? Yeah. Right. What are some other strategies that people can implement to be able to reduce attrition? Because the BPO industry has the second highest attrition rate of any job category in the world. The only one yeah. that's higher is retail. Which, of course, um, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the biggest one yeah. in terms of turnover. 67% yeah. attrition per year in the BPO industry on average. Yeah. It's absolutely massive. So any learnings that you've had from that that you could share with everybody? Gosh, I wish there was some sort of secret sauce. If anybody has it, I'm open to, uh, open <laughs> to suggestions here. Um, you know, I think that we have found that it's not just a money issue. You can't just throw money at it. Um, mm -hmm. Money doesn't only go so far. Um, you know, we have different things in place and different bonuses and different incentives, um, you know, to give agents an opportunity to earn more, right? This is an opportunity for you to, to earn a little bit more money, um, but it only goes so far. And so it, maybe it's like a little corny to kind of say, but really, I, I think that what, what, plays, what plays into our, our staff sticking around um, is, is the culture. It is, are we engaging with you? Are there, are we doing fun things? Are we listening to you? Right. Are mm. we, are we asking for your, for your feedback and then acting on that feedback, right? What, what kind of environment are we doing? Um, leaders hiring good leaders. Um, you know, if I see a, the, it's usually my first go-to, if I see that we're suffering in a particular area where, where there's a, you know, our attrition rate is higher for a particular client or, if, you know, for whatever reason, the first thing you go to is who are the leaders there? Right. Is there mm -hmm. a leadership issue? Um, so strong leaders, um, you know, who, again, embody, you know, what we, what, what we who we are and, and what we want to achieve, um, because there's nothing to me, there's nothing that will, uh, will will set off a grand exodus than if there's if there's a, a bad apple, a bad leader and, and people are not responding to. Um, so we try to take all those factors in, in, into consideration. Um, there's just so many variables, you know, and it's and the, uh, the other um, the uh, other complication of it is that, you know, the agents are leaving you. They're not necessarily telling you why they're leaving. Right. So you do the mm -hmm. exit survey and they give mm -hmm. you the reason why. Um, but, you know, do whether you they tell it, I do not believe those reasons. Right. Okay. I think I think you take them with it with a grain of salt. So it, that's also challenging. Right. If I could get the real reasons. Right. If you can get like this is really why I'm leaving. Then again, I, I know my problem. I come up with a solution. Yeah. We're just mm. having to guess. We're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping that, OK, maybe this this helps and this speaks to people. Um, but it just there's just so many variables that it's it's so hard to to come up with with something that 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 is that is a, that can have an effect enough right mm -hmm. over enough people and speaks to enough people that makes a difference um mm. but you gotta try we just we keep we keep trying i had a fantastic ex uh interview with a company called noon dalton that's also in the bpo industry and they gave me a really good tip for getting that real feedback which is you do the exit interview with the client or with the with the employee and then three months later you reach out to them again and you say hey uh, I'd love to really ask you what the real reason was. Would you mind telling me? Yeah. And you get a lot more honesty three months later than you do in the moment because they've had time to cool off and they've recognized right. that there's, um, they said they basically throw away that first exit interview. And then the three month post is the one that they really pay attention to, which I never saw anyone do that. And I thought that that was a really interesting way of doing it. Yeah. I've never heard of that either. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so let me throw a couple quick questions at you because we're getting towards the end of our hour now. Uh, sure. First question that I have, what do you think is the biggest mistake that happened at ISTA Solutions? If you had to really boil it down to, oh, this was the biggest mistake. I, I can actually, for Time Doctor, uh, I know what it is exactly. Actually, it's <laughs> you two. have an exact answer? Okay. Yes. So number one, it was not acquiring a competitor when they wanted us to acquire them and I should have mm -hmm. bought them and I didn't. 
And that was a problem. And then the second one was not having, and this is one that you couldn't actually, it, it wasn't a true problem for us because it wasn't something that we could control, but not having triple the amount of salespeople in March of 2020. Because uh, we completely uh-huh. exploded at that point and yep. our ability to be able to actually close deals, we went from a hundred seat account would be something that we would talk, that sales would talk to you yeah. if you had a hundred seat organization. But then we immediately switched to thousand seat accounts. Right. It was that crazy in terms of the transition. So um, those are the two that I can think about very clearly. What are some mistakes that ISTA had? Um Maybe even top three, but top one would be great. Um, my goodness, the top mistake. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something you only learn with with hindsight. But I think mm-hmm. initially, um, you know, we, like I said, Neo had come on well into our run here. You know, from from when we started, um, and I think we just didn't know. We didn't know enough at the time, but the guys that we had, we had sort of running running the show there initially um were just not they weren't they weren't capable of taking us to the next level right they mm. just it was and i think and i think we st- we hung on too long i think we identified that a little bit too late on um, the ground leadership on, on the ground leadership stuff. yeah okay. um and nothing to them nothing bad about them they were great guys mm-hmm. they just weren't they weren't what we needed right and in, in how right. we were set up again we are different we're different than a traditional bpo we have different yep. needs um and so they just weren't quite the right fit um and we just, we, we identified it, I think, way too late in the game. You know, we tried to sort of make it work. And I think that it stunted us a little bit back then. I think that we could have taken things a little bit to the next level sooner. Um, but we were, we were very stunted because of that. So I think, I think that was definitely one, one area that, again, we hope we learn from that, uh, you know, moving, moving forward. Um, and then the second thing is, as we were growing, we didn't have... Again, it took us way too long to kind of come to this, but we didn't have a good internal um, like repository, right? So we weren't really using an internal CRM or anything like that. So mm. everything that was in the Philippines lived there. Everything that was here lived here, and there was nothing speaking to each other. There was no visibility. There was no there was no accountability. It was emails. It was meetings. It was talking, but there was nothing binding everything together. And we were small enough that we could make it work, but there was just no way we were bringing this to any any sort of uh, you know seat count that that was gonna that was gonna be successful this way, right? Because mm-hmm. it was just there was nothing binding everything together. Um, so it was a process, right? We, we had to work through it and figure out what the best, and we continue. This is something that we continue to work on. Uh, we use uh, a program called QuickBase, um, which we, we developed, uh, you know, it's sort of a sandbox. So you can build it, and we, we, it, it's a very robust system now. started very small, and we built it over, over the years. Um, but um, not having that, you know, not having that was just led to so much so much headache, so much back and forth, inefficiency, just the amount of inefficiency we had of trying to get information and where's this holding and what's going on here and the amount of emails that had to go back and forth. It was just, um, it's crazy. Sometimes you look back, you're like, I don't even know how we survived. How did, how do you make it out of it? <laughs> you know, um, but During yeah, a little secret about the BPO industry, I've seen 10,000 plus seeders still run on Excel spreadsheets that are not in the cloud. Right. It's like, I know. It's unbelievable. I don't understand how you operate that way either. Un- unbelievable. Yeah. Project management is um, important and you need to be able to have that documentation in place and it needs to be able to be digitized. So you're speaking to the choir, you're preaching to the choir on that one. Yeah. Um, so what you talked about a thousand seats right now. What's stopping you from getting to 10,000 seats? What do you think is the next big challenge to be able that to is... get to that next you know, to add an extra digit right. to your seat count. That is a great question. And that is a part, we are in a transitional year here at ISTA in trying to do just that. Um, mm-hmm. We need to go after bigger fish. Um, we are, you know, going after a certain type of client um, of a certain size, and that's great. It worked for us. It's not that we won't continue to go after those clients, but it's about taking it to the next level. I don't think that we're at Fortune 500 level, right? We're mm-hmm. not uh, out there servicing Coca-Cola, but there's a whole level below that, right? There's a whole couple levels below that of, um, you know, big, big companies. Um, you know, we're trying to target companies that 
are on on the up, right? Up and coming. That um, mm -hmm. you know, so we don't necessarily have to go through all the red tape, but that have you know that are are, are looking to do this and money to spend. Um, so that's where we're, we're headed. Um, you know, going going to these big conferences, these big shows. Um, we're hoping uh, our goal for uh, next year is to be able to do some talking engagements and just really take the, it's about taking things to the next level, you know, do, uh, you know, have, have our pitch ready, you know, again, we're dealing with some smaller clients, so going in and winging it works, right? There's a certain amount, there's a certain charm to sort of going in and being like, this is what we do, and I can talk, you know, I can talk well about what we do. It's something different when you're talking about some of these companies that they're expecting a certain kind of, a certain kind of pitch, right? They're, they're expecting, right. there's certain expectations there. So we are in the process of, um, of doing that, of, of getting ourselves ready to do that. So it sounds almost to me like, you want to be able to invest in thought leadership, speaking at these these types of events, and then pulling yourself into a higher tier of clients. So exactly. we're not talking about five seaters; we're talking about hundred seaters or five hundred right. seaters, as an example. Got it. Yep. Okay. So we feel that we're ready. Um, you know, I, a year or two ago, I don't know if we would have been ready. We're, we're ready now, right? We feel that we have the structure right. and we have the the people in place. Um, so it's just a matter of of you know positioning ourselves as a company to do that. What do you think that the BPO industry needs to do differently? What do you think is a major fault that everyone seems to be continuing along with? I can tell you a couple off the top of my head, which is project management. They don't actually do it. Right? It's one of those things that right. just seems like a big problem where because we've been able to operate you know, on relatively okay margins, we don't need to become more efficient at building um, the exchange of information right. across across oceans. Uh, that's a big one for me. I think another one, which is a personal issue for me, is the lack of accountability, meaning how are we actually doing the work? What's the documentation of that work? And then how can we actually take that information to be able to optimize and produce better results for clients? Mm -hmm. But that's time, doctor, uh, at the end of the day. What do you right. think is a big mistake that the BPO industry is making that you wish everyone did differently? Um, I don't know if, I don't know if I can speak on the industry. Um, I don't know. I don't know as an industry, but in terms of like mm -hmm. our, our experience and with our clients, I think that there is a, there is still a lot of manual aspects to this, right? There's a lot of, you know, we, we get suckered into sort of the manual tracking and the productivity. And um, a lot of it is because, you know, our clients obviously are using software and they're using tools, but they also don't necessarily know how to use their tools completely. So right. it's okay. So you don't know how to pull out this report. So instead of learning how to pull out the report, we're doing redundant work and we're making the report manually. Um, it's inefficient. It's, you know, how accurate can it be? So I just, there, there's a lot of manual aspects to a lot of this, um, you know, to be able to, like you said, create sort of a, a, accountability or to be able to show these things. Um, when I know, I know in my heart that there are for sure automatic ways to do this. There's for sure, I can pull out reports and we can, we, we, we can do those sorts of things rather than doing it by hand. Um, but we haven't fully, I haven't fully transitioned to, to, hmm. to that yet. And I think, I think in the Philippines specifically, right, it's all about, you know, it's all about data. It's all about reports. Everybody likes their Excel and their trackers. You know, there's all, all these things going on and I get it. I get why we need it, right? We need the trackers. I need to be able to show what, what's happening. So I, I get the need for it. Um, but it's just the, the manualness of it is, is very tedious and just it not, it, it can't be the best way. I don't know what the you best know, way is, but it can't be the best way. <laughs> to um, not necessarily push back on that, but to add into it, I actually think the reasoning as to why that occurs is because the cost of labor in the Philippines is True. cheap. So it actually isn't as expensive to be able to have someone go in and manually, we have, we have clients of ours that um, go in and they'll pull reports out of Time Doctor. And they, I remember one particular client, it was someone's job to just pull these reports out of Time Doctor. And we did a CS call, a customer success call with them. And we said, well, why aren't you using our API? Like you can just, mm -hmm. boom, like think like an yeah. engineer and just right. solve the problem. Now, the employee <laughs> whose job it was to do that was terrified. But he said, listen, <laughs> we're gonna get you something else to do because to yeah. be honest with you, you moving information from A to B is ridiculous. You need to be yeah. able to actually automate this stuff and make it more efficient. But it's just the, the concept of, well, we could just get someone to do it and therefore it works is, um, 
is not the right way to do it. And I think that will be even more of a harsh reality shift as we see the rise of artificial intelligence and chat GPT mm-hmm. work into our market and everyone is going to have to level up to yep. be able to really kind of enter this new stage, which is manual input output devices in the in the face, it, 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 you know, in the definition of humans will no longer be a critical part of the way that we operate our industry. And we need to be able to think a lot smarter than that. So you um, you alluded to a very good point, and I just wanted to add into it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been great. For yeah. people that want to learn more about ISTA Solutions, where's the best place to be able to get that information? Um, well, you can definitely go to our website. Um, okay. So I think it's istasolutions.com. Right. Um, and then, of course, we love to, you know, love people to reach out, whether it's mm-hmm. to myself or uh, Michael. He's uh, he's our, our director of business development. Um, right. You know, we're happy to get on a call. A lot of a lot of this is discovery. You know, we get clients we're like, OK, this seems like a good idea. What what can we do? And we can mm-hmm. brainstorm. Right. What parts of what parts of your business does this make sense for? Um, you know, what are some of the use cases that might be uh, applicable to you? Um, so, yeah, we're happy to happy to hear from, you know, hear from anybody that might be interested. Perfect. All right. So we'll put that down in the show notes. Istasolutions.com is the company. We've been on the call with Nicole Barish. And if you want to learn more, go check out their URL. I'm sure they're very happy to talk to you. And the beauty of it is they do absolutely everything and anything under the sun. So if you want to go all the way from (laughs) dentistry to building AIs, you can do it with Ista Solutions. Thanks for being on the call. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. (laughs) 